Hey, good morning. Um, so I want to uh, continue where we uh, left off last time. Uh, last time we, we ended up discussing the borders of my hypothesis. Um, and so we said that if you start with, um, if you have C uh, symmetric uh, monoidal uh, infinity n category, whatever that is, um, and we have an object which we'll call O, there's a, there's a list of uh, list of criteria, criteria which we call uh, K dualizability for K going up to N, um, under which, uh, it's a list of hypotheses under which uh, hypotheses uh, we can define, define a topological field theory, uh, in which will just denote uh, Z of a K manifold is the integral over the K manifold of, um, of O. So there's an, uh, conditions on the, on the object O to be sufficiently finite. And if it's K finite for some number K less than N, that means we can define uh, this invariant. We can define a topological field theory defined up to K manifold. So this is of invariant for N uh, framed K manifolds. So these are K manifolds, but we're treating them as uh, N dimensional frame manifolds. Um, now, if you remember last time I said um, we were supposed to put quotation marks around everything I say. Um, that was especially true about, uh, as some people kindly pointed out to me, uh, some things I was saying about what I meant by a framed n-manifold. So, you know, take this all very, uh, very loosely. So, you, uh, when we talk about an n-frame k-manifold, that we, we're really just going to take our k-manifold and we're just going to cross it with r n minus k. Not going to try to do anything more baroque, but we're going to put a, a, an n-dimensional framing on this. We're going to trivialize this n-dimensional, the n-dimensional tangent bundle of, of this guy. Okay. Um, so erase from the memory anything else that might have been asserted. Um, all right. So, so yes. Uh, so this object, is, uh, it's this uniqueness theorem, is it up to equivalence or? Is uh, it's up to equivalence. So the, so the, so the, the, so the claim is that the, um, the category, you can make a category of these topological field theories and it's a groupoid. They're all, and it's labeled exactly by the, the group of K dualizable objects of this category. So there's an, there's an equivalence between topological field theories. So, and, so I didn't state the, the other part here, which is that the, any field theory, that extended field theory is of this form. It comes by integrating an object and, um, yeah, I don't know. So that's, that's, the, that's the assertion. Uh, and uh, I won't, I won't, um, I don't want to spend much time on this, but there's also, can get rid of this framing um, and that tends to be more, more useful. And in fact, here we won't need uh, to look at frame theories. We'll need something like oriented field theories. Um, and so, um, yeah. Uh, that's right. It's, it's manifolds equipped with, it's, a, it's framed manifolds. It's manifolds equipped with a trivialization. So not anything will, will appear like, for example, for an n-manifold, it'll have to be a framed n-manifold. So, so that's, that's our condition. But we might want to extend this to all, say, oriented manifolds or all spin manifolds or some other structure. And so there exists uh, one, one, hypothe one uh, corollary of this Kaboardism hypothesis, which I won't spell out, is that you get an action of the group O-N, say, on the, on the space of these, say, you could do this not just for n, but um, you can get, a, you get an action of, of, of O-N on the space of these n-dualizable objects, um, which is the same as the space of these, um, which is the space of these n-dimensional topological field theories in C. Um, and uh, to give, and if I give you a group G mapping to O-N, and the basic the example I will think of maybe SON or spin N or some other group. But if I give you a group mapping to ON, then uh, then to give a to give a topological field theory uh, value um, defined 
defined on manifolds, on n manifolds uh, with uh, structure group G rather than a framing. So I'm going to reduce, uh, I have a manifold where the tangent bundle is reduced to G rather than trivialized is equivalent to giving uh, a, a fixed point, a G fixed point, G fixed points in this space. Uh, and, and dualizable. So I have to trivialize some, this some action of the group G, say, or the group SON. If I want an oriented field theory, I want a field theory that's defined on all oriented manifolds. And again, that means if I have a K manifold, I stabilize it to be an N manifold and give an orientation of the N dimensional tangent bundle. Uh, then I need to give an SON fixed point in, uh, on the space of these dualizable objects. So, um, okay. So um, I don't want to spend a lot of time with this abstraction of, of this, um, but I wanted to give a couple of examples. Um, and these examples will help us uh, try to fill in this chart. So my goal right now is to explain S2 cross T2. So I'm going to try to get to S2 cross T2. Um, so I'll, I'll start with kind of a caricature of this. Um, so so the, the goal of right now is to um, give it this two-dimensional field theory, which will be x2 plus t, s2 times t2, uh, which will be, a, so this is going to be a two-dimensional topological field theory. And this is going to be a form of, uh, and I'll say it more precisely, it's a form of two-dimensional topological Yang-Mills theory. So let me, let me start with. Um, is that an actual s2, or is it like an s2 with an irregular puncture? No, this is an honest s2. Yeah, the, the irregular puncture was just there once okay. for, for fun. Um, um, no, that's right. So I'm, I'm actually, the way I'm, personally, I like to have circles to start the day. So I'm actually going to think of this as T2 cross S2. Once I'm in T2, I'm in a world that I know and I'll tell you more about. Uh, and then I look at this theory on S2, on P1. And, um, so that, that's out of my, my, my route. Uh, as you'll notice, there's, that chart is way underdetermined. There's a lot of choices being made in every slot there. For example, having one slot called geometric Langlands. There's a lot of things that go into that, and I'll try to spell them out as we go along. But um, so, so let's start with uh, maybe everyone's favorite uh, toy field theory. Let's start with uh, G, a finite group. Let's start with, um, start with a finite group, and we'll define this 2D Yang-Mills for finite group. So let's call Z equals Z sub G, which is um, this topological, which is so G gauge theory in two dimensions. Um, in two dimensions. So what does this mean? So I, uh, here I, I'm, uh, I'm going to give you what my fields are. And fields are, are G bundles. So that's what it means to be a gauge theory. Uh, since G is finite, there's not a lot of uh, ambiguity about what, uh, what I mean by, uh, by, by, by G bundles. Fields on any M will be G bundles on M which are the same as flat G bundles or G Galois covers or uh, homomorphisms from pi 1 of M into G up to uh, equivalence. So that's um, any notion you might think of, that, they're all the same. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you say something about this notation in Yeah, yeah it's, it's, in, it's incredibly misleading. Yeah, it's. Is it just supposed to remind us of flat integrals or you think they are different? Well, in some sense, it's more recently historically it's supposed to remind you of factorization homology, which I'll talk about today or tomorrow, uh, which is a special case of this. Uh, it's a um, it's going to be a, in some settings it's going to be taking global flat sections of some sheaf, so it's, it has this kind of an integration feeling. Uh, I I don't know if it's fair to think of it as the path integral in that when I write integral over m, I mean, it's, it's some shadow of the path integral, but integral of m over o, o is not the Lagrangian. This object is not the Lagrangian. It's something I've attached to a little piece. So someone suggested an interpretation yesterday that I didn't understand. Other people suggested me that there's density matrices that are closer. I mean, there, we'll also talk about this as the, the well, collection of. For the, no one with cobordism hypothesis, I just made this up. It's not uh, established notation. For factorization homology, it comes because it's really some global flat sections of something. It's really some integrals, right? it conformal, it's conformal <coughs> blocks, uh, which I'll, I'll explain 
little bit later. So, uh, but the, it's just a convenient, I think notation is important. It sort of makes the Kubernetes of mathematics is a peerless. It's, a, it's giving an integration procedure. It's an abstract characterization of an integration procedure, but it's not, it's not given by formula. Uh, there's no Riemann sums as far as I know. Um, well, that's what factorization homology will be. Um, okay, so, um, all right, so now, or you can think about these as maps from M to the classifying space of G bundles, lo lots of ways of thinking about G bundles. Um, I'm going to, when I say uh, this thing, I'm going to think of this as, as a orbifold or as a stack. So I'm not looking at these up to, really up to equivalence. I'm going to remember the equivalences. Remember these guys have automorphisms. Um, okay, and so, um, so now I need to define my field theory. So say Z of a point, which again, I'm thinking if you'd like a Z of R2. Um, it's a two-dimensional field theory. So Z of a point, I'm, I want to assign a category. So I'm just going to, and the, the, the ansatz we, we took last time was we take uh, vector bundles on the space of fields on R2 or, or a point. Does it matter? Uh, and so that means vector bundles, that means vector bundles on, well, there's only one G bundle on a point, uh, but it has G automorphisms, which is the same as representations of the group G. Uh, and let me just fix a, everything is going to be complex. Uh, so that's my category. It's a category representation of group G. We said last time you might prefer, rather than think of a category, to think of an algebra. This is the same as the modules for the group algebra of G. So that's if you want to think of this as assigning an algebra. The algebra is the group algebra of G. It's this non-commutative algebra of functions on G with convolution. Um, okay. Um, and now, so that's the, the condition. And actually, we, we heard yesterday from Andre uh, a version of the statement that the two-dualizability, the, uh, the fact that this category defines a 2D field theory is equivalent in this setting to saying that um, this category, or if you prefer the algebra, well, the al uh, let's say it's the algebra is finite dimensional uh, semi-simple um, algebra. Um, okay, uh, maybe better to say separable if I wasn't over C, but I am over C, so I will say semi-simple. Um, Okay, and, um, and to make this an oriented field theory, which is how I'm going to think about this, is to give, um, give CG the extra structure of a Frobenius algebra, so to give it an invariant trace. Okay, so that's, so the group algebra has a trace, the evaluation has the identity, and that makes this a Frobenius algebra, and the claim is that's what makes this an oriented field theory. So now what does this field theory do? Let's spell out what this field theory attaches <coughs> to various manifolds. So, we know what it attaches now to, um, what is, um, what is spin? Where's Sam? Ask Sam that I mean. Uh, I mean, it's, it's better than spin, so, so you ask me what is less, less than Frobenius. Um, I mean, did, where's Sam? Uh, oh, there, Kevin. Right, so what does that mean for the group algebra? Is there not, I mean, Okay, hi okay. Kevin. Um, all right, so, um, okay, so, um, all right, so now uh, Z of S1, so again, this is going to be functions or functionals on the space of fields on S1. Everything is discrete. We don't have a lot of notion, options of what functions mean. Um, so this just means uh, functions on G mod g. So what are fields on the circle? A field on the circle is given by its monodromy, it's an element of the group, up to conjugation. So this is the, my notation for g module of the conjugation action. So look at g mod conjugation action, that's uh, flat connections or g covers of the circle. And you look at functions on there, that just means class functions. So that's class uh, functions on my finite group. Uh, and finally, now what about z, z of a surface? Uh, let's just write, uh, might as well just write the notation for a surface with, uh, with boundary. Well, okay, so what is, what is um, well, what are fields on a surface? Uh, again, they're, like on anything else, they're G bundles, they're G bundles on this surface. If I give you a surface with boundary, uh, it gives me a correspondence between G bundles on the incoming and G bundles on the outgoing boundaries. 
So these look like a bunch of copies of G mod Gs. These look another cop bunch of copies of G mod Gs. Uh, these are G bundles on the out incoming outgoing circle. And the operation defined, so these vector spaces will get operations defined by uh, taking a function here, pulling it back, and pushing it forward. So we're just counting bundles. So let's just say so if z of z of sigma, if sigma is a closed surface, if we don't have any boundaries to think about, this is just the number of G bundles on sigma. So it's just the total the integral of the function 1, if you'd like. Except that where, if you like, what is the measure here? If I give you a G bundle, I need to count it correctly with automorphisms. So the measure of a point of a G bundle is, is 1 over the automorphisms of that point. So this is the kind of corrected count of the number of G bundles on sigma. And that's my, my path integral. This kind of the finite. That is, so that is the describing the operations of this field theory. Now, uh, what I wanted to use this field theory for was to um, emphasize a couple of structures that we get um, in, in topological field theory in general that we'll, we'll want to use in more tricky situations. Yeah. Um, uh, Z of an interval is, um, are you trivializing? The, I mean, it's Z of the interval is something like the group algebra of G. If you, if you, look, at the, if you look at G bundles in the interval with trivializations at the two points, at the two endpoints, that is the group algebra of G. And then there's a, the multiplication is just concatenation of intervals. Uh, if you look at an interval without any points, and then that's uh, functions on BG, and there aren't a lot of functions on BG, so it's just C. And, you know, so in general, yeah. So in particular, if you like uh, people who like Heck algebra, so if you look at an interval with two, where you look at G bundles with some reduction to some subgroup K at the two ends, this will be functions on G mod K mod K. And you'll see the, the convolution structure on this just by concatenating these intervals together. Okay. Um, so um, now uh, some structures that you get on the circle, again, some of this uh, appeared in, um, in Andre's talk <coughs> last night. Um, if I um, look at what, what, what do I attach in a field theory to a circle, I can interpret it the following way. I can take the circle and chop it up into two hemisphere, hemicircles, whatever they're called. Um, and what I get out of this is if I look at, uh, so if I have z of a circle, so here z of a point is some category. Here I'll get the opposite category if I'm keeping track of orientations. Um, so um, what does this diagram give me? It gives me a map. This diagram gives me a, a, a sorry, maybe I should do the, 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 the example of a 1D field theory first. So plus I have an example of a 1D field theory. I might assume I'm attaching a vector space v to a point, um, and then to a point with the opposite orientation, I'll attach another vector space, which I'll call v check. And if I write this diagram, I get a map uh, from k to v tensor v check, which we'll call uh, eta, and a map from v tensor v check to k, which we'll call epsilon. That's this map. Uh, so this is eta and this is epsilon. And, um, and these maps satisfy, as Andre explained, they satisfy the mark of Zorro. Um, so that if I, if I go from V to V, tensor V check, to V to V, this composite is identity. And that identity realizes this establishes V check as the dual of V. Uh, and, it, uh, and in particular, it implies that um, V is finite dimensional, this thing is identified with endomorphisms of V in such a way that this map is the trace and this map is the identity map, the inclusion of the identity. Okay. So if I give you a one-dimensional oriented topological field theory, the vector space I'm attaching has to be finite dimensional. Um, and I realize, I realize its dimension if I look at this composite epsilon of eta, which is what I attach to the circle is going to be the composite of these two maps. In other words, the trace of the identity, which is the dimension of V. Um, so you see the dimension of V as invariant attached to a circle. Uh, that's in the case of one-dimensional field theories. Uh, where in the case of two-dimensional field theories, we're, uh, we now have a category attached to a point. And what we'll attach to the circle is something you might call the, the dimension, uh, some kind of dimension of this category. 
So what does that mean? Um, so let's write down, we have, uh, let's say, z of a, a point, let's call it some category c, but let me also identify it as modules for some algebra a. Then what is this diagram? Um, this diagram gives me a, a functor from vect. Remember, vect is what I attach to the empty set. Um, I get a vec from c tensor c up, which is going to be bimodules for a. Um, and what is this functor? It's going to be just the inclusion. Um, oh, let me, let me, this is going to be identified with endomorphisms of C. And this is the inclusion of the identity, or it's the inclusion of the bi diagonal bimodule. A is a diagonal bimodule. So what you attach to two points is A bimodules. This is the inclusion of the diagonal bimodule. On the other hand, you have a functor the other way, which is a kind of trace on endofunctors. Um, so I need to go from an A by module to a vector space, and there's a natural operation, which is I can tensor um, over A with over A tensor A up with this by module A. So I could take, um, and so this is what, so that's what this guy is. That's what this guy is. So it's the, the trace of a by module or the trace of an endofunctor. And so um, this, and this operation is also what's called the Hochschild homology of a bimodule. And so what we get out of this composite is um, that z of the circle is going to be trace of the identity on uh, the category C, which is A mod, or it's the Hochschild homology of A itself, which is A tensor A over A tensor A up, which is called just the Hochschild homology of A. So that's going to be my, my uh, invariant attached to a circle. So now this, this uh, calculation is sort of very uh, robust. Uh, you can define a notion of this kind of traces in any, in any dimension of field theory. I can always imagine that really I would secretly cross with some other manifold M. So there's Z of M cross S1, kind of a slogan, is this kind of dimension in the appropriate categorical sense of Z of M. And here the dimension of the category A mod is the Hochschild homology of A. So this is the idea. You just draw M cross S1. You take S1 up into these two parts, and then you interpret what those two parts are. OK. Um, and in case this looks, if you, this is the first time you're seeing this, you can ask, what is this? If this is the first time you're seeing this, it's probably very fast. Uh, but what is this uh, Hochschild homology? If you, um, if I take A tensor A over A tensor A up, well, this is generated by expressions of the form 1 tensor A. Uh, in fact, you can check there's a map here, which is A goes to 1 tensor A. And is this map is the universal trace. It's the universal trace that it's a universal map that equates trace AB equals trace of BA. So clearly, you take A and you quotient out by, by those expressions. Um, so it's a target of the universal trace, which makes, makes it kind of the home for characters, for traces in some abstract setting. In any case, what we've calculated, if you'd like, from this field theory is that the Hochschild homology of the group algebra of a group is just class functions, which is the span of characters of representations of the group. So this is kind of the abstract way of saying, of saying Wait, that. Wait, did we learn that last time? What? Did we, learn we did, because we calculated, we said we had a two-dimensional field theory. And we said, what it, oh, the last fact that it was a span of characters? Yeah. No, uh, you learned that in other places. Um, <laughs> right, so the, I can, I can, I can re relearn it here, but we can do that later. Um, so so this is, the claim is that Hochschild homology is a topological place where characters want to live, and you already knew that for finite groups. Probably for other things, too. Um, OK, so we'll, we'll talk more about structures on this later. Um, this is just sort of one, one role of the, of the class functions we know is as characters. And this is the topological field theory kind of origin of that. Um, but there's another role which comes from thinking of the circle uh, with a different framing as a two-manifold. So we're thinking about, so our theory happens to be an oriented theory. So we didn't actually need to keep track of framings. But there's another picture we can draw involving the circle, um, which also appeared in Andre's talk. Um, if we think of the circle 
as a part of a little annulus, circle framed as a part of the blackboard framing, then this, um, so the z of this circle uh, carries a natural multiplication. Uh, it carries a natural multiplication, which comes from the pair of pants. So if you look at z of the pair of pants, and we draw it in this flattened form, z of the pair of pants, the pair of pants is a cobordism. This gives a map from z of s1 tensor z of s1 to z of s1. Um, and uh, and this so this and now this multiplication uh, 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 makes us into something like a commutative algebra. Now re remember what we said we have a, a family of multiplications over the space of all pairs of pants. So this again appeared in, in Andre's talk. Here's one pair of pants. I can also start moving around in the space of all pairs of pants. Start moving the circle around. The, since everything here is discrete, that my assignment has to be locally constant in in this uh, in this parameter. So I get out of this an equation that A star B is identified as well as equal to B star A. It's equal because I don't have a lot of room to, for interesting isomorphisms. So really, they have an isomorphism between these two guys, but they're just living in a vector space. So they're just equal. Um, so this just follows for me. I have a multiplication labeled by every pair of pants. So we'll discuss this structure in more detail later. Um, one way to, uh, to think of what this is doing is that um, maybe to think of this circle as being much smaller, think of uh, taking the identity functor. So here is uh, my category C, which is A mod, and here is A mod, and this interval is saying do nothing. This is just the passage of time. But now I can uh, think of making a two-dimensional bordism where I add another time variable and at some other time cut out a little disk like this. So this picture is giving a, a, a bordism between the identity and the identity. So what it's actually giving me is a map from z of s1, kind of an action on the identity functor of the category of A modules. Um, if you like, you can do what like Andre suggested. You can kind of shrink this picture. Um, you can shrink this maybe, let's shrink it a little bit like this. Or you can shrink it even more and try to do a kind of a non-Hausdorff-y thing uh, where I just think of taking the a time interval. So think of the, the two-dimensional direction as being very small. I have the, the interval, and then at some point, I kind of decide to modify it. So I'm thinking of this as my picture for that non-Hausdorff guy, the double point. Can't really draw a double point. In any case, the, the idea is that z of s1 is something that acts as an amorphism of the identity functor. And in fact, it's, it's an isomorphism. So under this, um, this picture, you can check, gives you an isomorphism from z of s1 to endomorphism of identity. Uh, which is compatible with this multiplication. Composition of endomorphisms is given by this multiplication. So, um, assuming that that's an isomorphism for this particular example, it's not a general statement. It's a general statement for two of Um Yeah, uh, so I don't want to prove that, but that's, that is a general statement. So the claim is that if you look at the value of the circle with this, I mean, I'm just, I think of it just as a circle, uh, this is the same as the, what's called the Hochschild cohomology of my category C, which is uh, endomorphisms of the identity functor. Well, what is the identity functor? If I think of C as A mod, it's endomorphisms. So if I, if I look at um, functors from A modules to A modules, one natural way to, to give them is by giving a bimodule. So I have the bimodule A. So the bimodule A is a functor, which I can think of tensoring over A with A. That's the, just the identity. That's, that's what the bimodule A, and if you look at endomorphisms of this bimodule, so endomorphisms of A as an A bimodule, that's this, that's the center. So in our case, this is uh, the assertion that the center of, um, oh yeah, so let me finish writing this. Again, before I said that Hochschild homology was this kind of universal trace where I uh, co-equalized A, B, and B, A, I can also equalize A, B, and B, A. Look at something mapping in, which commutes with everything else. And that's the center. So if you think carefully, well, th this is a good exercise, think what this definition actually means. The claim is that's the center of an algebra. This is just a funny, funny way of writing the center of an algebra. And so that's the center of the group algebra, which is another, which is another manifestation of another role for class functions. OK. Um, but the, but the, the real role of this, I want to say, is that um, 
what does endomorphisms of the identity functor mean? It's a ring over which everything you write is linear. So any operation you write. So every object carries an, an action of this ring. That's endomorphism identity. And it's compatible with all maps. So it's a ring that acts on everything, every structure in the theory C. If you think what that means, it means that the entire field theory is linear over this ring. You started with this kind of nice old field theory that was defined over the complex numbers. And what you discover is that this field theory actually lives over, is actually all living in modules over some nice, bigger commutative ring, which is the center. Um, so let's, let's try to, to spell that out. And this is going to lead us to this notion of a, kind of a moduli space of a theory. So again, let's spell it out. In the case of the group algebra, uh, I can write uh, functions on g mod g. Uh, if I, I write it as a direct sum over irreducible representations of my finite group, um, of the span of the character of the representation. Uh, maybe I want to divide by the dimension. I want these to be so uh, some normalized version of the character. So this will be an, uh, an idempotent in the group algebra. So I've written this. This writes. This is now an isomorphism of rings where each guy, each of these, is an idempotent, and this is given this this action of a center. So as as a ring, this this center, this algebra group function is just a direct sum of a bunch of copies of C. Um, and so let me, um, so let's define the moduli space of the theory, the moduli of vacua. This is not traditional terminology, but I like it. Um, moduli of vacua, let's just define it to be uh, the spectrum of this algebra, um, Z of S1. It's a commutative ring. Well, in other words, it's spectrum of this ring, in our case, C of G mod G, um, which is just a, a finite set of points, which is just the set of irreducible representations of G. Okay. So we've, we've written this finite set of points. And, um, and the, what the claim is that our entire topological field theory is linear over the space. It breaks up into a bunch of field theories parameterized by this space. Or if you like the notation we talked about yesterday, it's, it's a theory that's defined relative to this space. Um, so what does that mean? I want to claim that everything in this theory breaks up. So if you look, for example, the category, rep G, that's the category we attach to a point, the category breaks up as a direct sum. For every irreducible representation of G, you can write down multiples of that, of that representation. The category breaks up as a sum of categories labeled by this set. If you look at the, um, the algebra attached to a circle, well, that's where we already got that decomposition. What about the invariant first surface? The invariant first surface also breaks up as a sum. Uh, the invariant of any surface is going to be a sum of contributions from V in uh, irreducible representations of G of, let me call it Z of sigma sub V. And where do I get this? Well. I, I assume a lot of you have seen this picture of, of two-dimensional field theories that the invariant you attach to a surface can be completely determined by what you attach to a pair of pants, uh, by what you attach to a circle together with its Forbe commutative Frobenius algebra structure that you attach using a pair of pants. This decomposition is giving an isomorphism of C of G as a Frobenius algebra, as a direct sum of Frobenius algebras. And that means that the invariant you attach to any surface breaks up as a sum. So, so the invariant we're attaching to a surface is really, um, it's a sum. So really what that means is that we've refined, we've refined the invariant attached to a surface uh, to a function, to a function on this moduli space, on this finite set of points. It just means there's a bunch of contributions that you can think about separately. The actual invariant was summing them all up. That's right. So there's a f kind of a silly field theory that to a point will attach uh, sh bundles of categories over this finite set, which just means a category for each point. <laughs> and to uh, one manifold will attach vector bundles over this finite set. And to a two manifold will attach functions over this finite set. And well, to three manifold would want to attach some number. But that's what it wants to be a three-dimensional field theory. And the idea is that the values of my field theory are naturally this way. So the theory naturally lives. So this is an incredibly silly thing to do in, my, in this example. You already understand representations of a finite group, and this doesn't really help you at all. Um, 
the idea is going to be that this is how we're going to understand a lot of stuff that happens up here. Um, this notion of, this is uh, kind of some mathematical approximation of this notion of moduli of vacua. Um, so that is that the theory knows something intrinsic, um, knows some intrinsic space over which it wants to live. Um, so we'll, we'll get, get to that. But before that, let's uh, make this example a little closer to x of t2. If, uh, if g now is uh, the next version of the example, if g is, is a compact Lie group, uh, then there's a topological field theory, which really more goes by the name of 2D topological Yang-Mills theory. And it's basically the same thing I wrote down, except g is not required to be finite. Um, and so what does it mean? So uh, I'll only sketch it kind of uh, schematically that z of a point now is again going to be some, the category of, of unitary rep uh, representations of my compact group. Um, and now z of the circle is going to be, so now I have to be a little careful of the couple of variants, it's going to be some kind of class functions class functions on, um, on the group. And now I have to be a little careful if I mean L2 class functions with, uh, or algebraic class functions, just finite sums of, of matrix elements. That's right. So I want to spell out. So the claim is that the z of a point knows everything. So, so why should you then have to be careful? Shouldn't it tell you what to do? Uh, because I have to be careful what do I mean by this representation, so what kind of size size I mean. So if I mean sort of finite dimensional algebraic representations, uh, okay. then, what, what then I'll get finite combinations of matrix elements. But if I look at some Hilbert space representations, you know, with finite multiplicities, then I'll get something like an L2. Right now, so the problem is that there are infinitely many simple objects. There are infinitely many simple objects. That's right. So this, yeah. That's right. So I have to be, I have to be careful. Now, it's, it's a perfectly fine category, and it's perfectly fine one dualizable category. It's not going to be a two dualizable category, uh, in particular because whatever I mean by the space of class functions, it's certainly not finite dimensional. So if I look at z of s1 cross s1, so if I try to calculate what is z of s1 cross s1, that's supposed to be the dimension of z of s1, and that's infinite. So this theory can't, doesn't have a chance to make sense on arbitrary two-manifolds. Um, but the claim is that it almost does. Um, so, um, okay, so, let, let, let's, so I'll try to explain the sense in which it does in the same sense here. It, it makes sense kind of relative to something. So, um, so this, this space of class functions on G, you can write that, you can think of this as some space of, um, some space of functions on the torus, which are vial group invariant, or L2 functions on the, on the torus, which are vial group invariant. Um, so if we're in the case, uh, well, OK. So in the case of uh, SUN, this just means um, functions, that, this just means functions on, on the n symmetric power of the circle, or symmetric power of the circle for SUN. So that's what class functions on a compact group look like. They look like vial group invariant functions on the torus. Um, that's an infinite dimensional vector space. But, um, but nonetheless, um, but nonetheless, this ring, uh, z of s1, uh, this ring of class function, has, has a, a structure of a commutative ring, and a commutative ring. And as a commutative ring, it's not this ring. This is as a vector space, as a vector space. Um, but you have to give this structure of convolution. This is the, the structure of tensor product. To get this thing as a ring, it looks like a direct, this ring looks like a direct sum um, over all irreducible representations of the group of, uh, of a one-dimensional vector space. So if you'd like, you have the, I don't know, you have your, this is supposed to be my attempt to draw a collection of irreducible representations of a group, something like that. So this is the collection of your, some picture for irreducible representations of something, uh, maybe SU3 or something. Um, 
So this is the set of irreducible representations. And just like in the finite groups case, if you ask what is the structure of the group algebra under convolution, it's just a direct sum of one-dimensional rings for each of these guys. So there's a copy of C for each of these dots. There's infinitely many of them, but it's a perfectly defined ring. And this ring is um, identified as a vector space. It's identified with this guy by, by, by just Fourier series. If your group was U1, this would just be functions on Z identified with functions on the circle under, under the, on the Fourier series. And the multiplication here corresponds to the convolution there. So this is just, just a version of Fourier series. Um, and, um, and moreover, the claim is that the, um, so if I wanted, so this finite, this uh, infinite set of points, this infinite discrete set of points, this is what I will have as my moduli space. So this is spec of z of s1. If I look at this field theory, z of s1 has a commutative ring structure. I can look at this finite, this uh, not finite set of points. This is the moduli space of the theory. And the whole field theory breaks up over this thing. So again, the category of representations, a representation of a compact group, is just giving a finite dimensional vector space at each of these dots. Right? No, it's just a scheme. It, it, well, it, I mean, you know, it's, it's a product of C's. I mean, it's just this, the scheme is the disjoint union of a bunch of dots. Again, I'd have to be careful about maybe what kind of completion I was doing at, at infinity. But, but over here, it's just a disjoint union of a bunch of dots. Uh, this, I mean, I am drawing the scheme, which is back on this guy. Um, and so, and moreover, the category of representations look like vector bundles over here. I just need to give you a, a vector space at each point. The, so the category C, which is Z of a point, uh, looks, like, uh, looks like vector bundles over this space M. Uh, Z of a circle, by definition, was functions on the space M. And moreover, the claim is that Z of any surface, it makes sense, uh, sense as a function, as a function on M. So if, for example, if I wanted to define the dimension of uh, Z of S1, the dimension of the group ring, that doesn't make sense because I was trying to add up the number 1 over each of these points. So adding up all the numbers 1 over each of these points doesn't make sense because there are infinitely many, one of, many of them. But the actual function, which is attaching 1 to each of these points, is certainly a well-defined function. Yeah. Well, I'm not, I'm not adding it up. Yeah, but I mean, I say. I think that's right, but yeah. But I think Z of a, um, yeah, I think Z of surfaces converges, right, for hygienous? For hygienous surfaces. So the, but the claim is that Z of any surface makes sense as an invariant here. That for any surface, you get a well-defined function on the set, which you then can tr ask whether it adds up. Some, can you can sum it or not. So the claim is that this theory makes sense relative to this space of, of vacuum. So it's a topological field. It's a 2D topological field theory in a weaker sense than what we were introducing before. It's a field theory that may, that's defined sort of relative to its, this, this intrinsic space, this moduli of vacuum. So again, I'm belaboring something that's probably confusing. The claim is going to be that that's the kind of structure we're going to see from theory X. We're not going to see honest four-dimensional topological field theories in the sense that you might have heard from the cobordism hypothesis. We're going to see a, a, a four-dimensional theory relative to some moduli space of vacua. These are the same moduli spaces that are appearing in, in Tudor's and Andy's talks. So we'll try to get, get to there. Um, and, if, and maybe just, um, just to have something to, to draw, um, if I literally look at, um, if I literally want to do um, z of s2 cross t2, I basically do the same thing, except um, so so if G is now complex, um, then, uh, X, then X of T2 cross S2 is going to be exactly the same Yang-Mills theory, but for this, for G, is the same Yang-Mills theory. This is, well, goes by the name of something like Yang-Mills Higgs. Um, and it's the same thing, but except that I, I attach Z of a point is going to be just the category of representations of algebraic, say, representations of my, my complex group G. 
Um, and uh, which is, if you'd like, modules over the ring of algebraic functions, actually like co-modules over the ring of function, the group algebra of G. Um, and then Z of a circle is going to be uh, functions on G. These are class functions, which are functions on the complex torus val invariant, but under a Fourier transform. So it's basically the same. I'm just you know, dropping unitarity. Kind of a complexified, it's a complexified form of what I had before, where probably I should have had reality conditions. Uh, well, <laughs> I guess I complexified it. When you wrote here Z of a point of vector bundles on M, is that? Um, Well, I, I, right, so that was what I didn't, what I said I was ignoring, right? So you have to, when I said representations of the group, uh -huh. I, I, I was intentionally kind of loose about that. So if I talk about finite dimensional representations of the group, those would be vector bundles with finite support. Uh -huh. But if you like so admissible representations, the kind of natural class of representations that you want, you'd want a vector space, um, things with finite multiplicities. Right. The representation with finite isotopic components, then you'd have things with finite support, with um, finite multiplicities, but possibly infinite. So that's sort of the more natural class of representation there. And that's going to be closer to L2 class functions on the group. Can someone find a correct discussion of this in the literature? No. <laughs> Not in this, well, probably. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, something, yeah. There are correct discussions of 2D angles there. Uh, so look at Greg Moore's. There's this uh, book by Moore, uh, Ramgulam, and. Um, did you say how to get this uh, 2D yeah. Yeah. theory out of theory X? What? Did you say for the compact group how to get this? Yeah, so the claim is this is what you're going to get. No, for the compact, no one, no. The theory X is naturally about the complex one. It's complexified. There's no way to get this No, no, it was kind of a warm up. I mean, it was somehow, but it's one that's sort of more familiar. Um, so what you get is X of um, T2 cross S2. Ah, uh, yeah, so what I, what, I, what I forgot to say is what, what this, the point is what is this Z of sigma trying to do? It's trying to be this, um, you know, what is this invariant you wanted to attach to the surface? Yeah, uh, sorry, I, I missed the punchline. Um, that this invariant, that what this Yang-Mills theory wants to do, that Z of a surface is some kind of volume. Z of surface is trying to be some kind of symplectic volume. Volume of the moduli, uh, of the moduli space, moduli space of G connections, G connections on sigma. So that's the kind of natural analog of what we had for a finite group. But now it's um, no longer a discrete set. So we want to look at flat, flat G connections uh, on, on sigma, which is, if you'd like, the space of uh, stable, stable comp bundles on, on the corresponding Riemann surface. Uh, and you're trying to define some kind of volume for this space. And that's what, this is uh, what you're trying to do. And this doesn't always make sense. Uh, and that theory is trying, trying to make sense of that. Uh, what we're going to do here is, um, so, let, so here in the, in the Yang-Mills-Higgs theory, we're going to try to do the same thing for the moduli space of Higgs bundles. Sorry, what, what is Z sigma sub B? That's the volume of moduli of high G connections on sigma such that B is. Where's, where's B? Oh, oh, I see. Uh, I don't have a, you know, it's kind of a Fourier dual picture. I mean, it's not, it's, it's not something you're going to say. It's not a geometric decomposition. It's kind of a Fourier decomposition. So there's a contribution to the volume of modular space labeled by representations. Um, so here we had, uh, again, functions here, which looked at, there's a Fourier transform identifying this with a direct sum over uh, dominant co of of just copies of C. Um, weights of copies of C. And then the invariant you attach to a, a surface is trying to be the volume. It's trying to be the volume of the moduli space of Higgs bundles, which, or this, of the Hitchin space, as it's going to appear in uh, some version of uh, moduli space of the Hitchin space of, for this complex group G on sigma, which will be discussed in, in Andy's talk, which is non-compact. This thing doesn't literally make sense, but this is what this theory is trying to calculate. Um, but again, this, this invariant is going to make sense somehow relative, relative to the center. It's going to be a, an infinite sum, which is not convergent of, of contributions that make sense. So it's oh. going to be a number. Yeah, it's trying to be a number. So is it fair to say that one way to get around this finiteness condition, why about dualizability and all that, yeah. is just to say, um, well, the integral of the 
this thing what we ex hope would be a number, but it's not, so we're just going to tell you the function instead. Exactly. Say, pretend you would integrate. Exactly. So the claim is that um, if you had a two-dimensional field theory, a full two-dimensional field theory, you can refine the invariant you get to a closed surface is naturally a sum of contributions labeled by characters of what you attach to the circle. And that s those individual contributions make sense under weaker conditions than, than the full sum. So for example, instead of having a finite dimensional semi-simple algebra, you can ask for a finite dimensional semi-simple algebra over its center, something like an Azumai algebra or something like that. So that's a, much, that's a much bigger class of algebras, which will still define <coughs> invariants for surfaces in this weaker sense. Yeah? So the claim that this theory can be written as x uh, induced along t2 cross s2 yeah. uh, is making some predictions about symmetries of this Young Mill space, right? You were supposed to see symmetries of t2, like SL2z or. That's right. Can you actually. Yeah. So we'll explain that. So that's going to be explained as part of. So this category of representations of G, this category is also has the fancier name as it's called the spherical Hecke category. Um, it's a category, um, well, OK, that's a fa fancy name for category of representation of group. But it's something that naturally will appear in geometric Langlands on the two-sphere. And so we'll see. And so I'll explain what you know, we'll, those SL2z but one thing that you can see from that, the, the SL2Z is going to be subtle. It's going to involve uh, switching the group G and the Langlands dual group. And that's because I've had all these, made these secret choices. When I, when I had circles in the theory, I said I was making some kind of choices and marking them in order to fix which group I have. So let's suppose I'm in ADE, so I don't need to worry. But then, I need, but then the SL2Z is switching around my circles on the two torus. And so it's, it's going to exchange uh, adjoint and simply connected groups. So it's actually going to be a Langlands duality. So what, when, you, when you do this SL2Z theory, it won't kind of respect the group G. It will relate it to the Langlands dual group. So just a element of SL2Z. Uh, yeah, the other ones are easier to say, but I forget. So yeah, the, the T is always easier to describe. I'll, I'll say what we can say what they are when we get to geometric Langlands. So with G equals SL2 and sigma some manifold of your choice, can you write what this function is? Like the number it attaches to positive. Probably. Um, yeah, OK. Um, all right, so maybe um, let me make a, 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 a kind of a, f a, s a silly uh, deep point, which is um, that this vector space we attach to the circle, um, so if we look, so this, we have the space of, uh, let's not, I'm not going to worry too much about real or complex. Um, in the case of, um, let's suppose my group is, uh, is SLNC, or in the compact case, if I have SUN, then this, um, then the space, uh, T mod W is the symmetric power of, 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 um, uh, of the circle, or maybe I'll think of symmetric power of, of, of C star. So the space, so I, what do I have here? I have some space of functions. And if I was really being more careful about completions, maybe I have something like L2 functions on a space uh, of, what is this? This is the configurations, configurations of uh, n minus 1 particles uh, living in C star. So it's, well, n minus 1 points in C star. I'm going to call them particles. So if you look at some kind of space of functions, L, let's call them L2 functions for fun. L2 function on a configuration space, this is what you would think of as the, the Hilbert space of a particle system. If you're trying to write down a mechanical system, a, a quantum mechanical system of n minus 1 particles uh, interacting, uh, living on C star or, or on the circle, you'd write a Hilbert space, which is L2 functions on this space of configurations. Uh, and then you'd write them some Hamiltonian on this. And in fact, you could ask, what are my Hamiltonians? In fact, I have a collection. So on the, my vector space, so my L2 of my uh, particle space uh, has two different roles. Well, it's isomorphic to z of the circle. That's where I got, that's where z of the circle was. But it's also, let me forget that it's isomorphic to, let me uh, remember that it's acted on by z of a circle. So I have this, this commutative ring. It happens to be acting on itself. Now, but this commutative ring, I wrote down as a direct sum over v in irreducible representations of g of one-dimensional guys. 
uh, which are characters that do some normalization. So what does this mean? This means I have a distinguished set of commuting operators on this vector space. So I have a, a, a whole bunch of commuting operators on this vector space, which is exactly what a quantum integrable system is supposed to look like. So this is, this is an example of a quantum, um, a quantum integrable system. Well, to say that it's integrable, I would need to say that it's, uh, that you have enough, what does it mean to be integrable? That would mean I have enough Hamiltonians to simultaneously diagonalize everything. But I do. These two are isomorphic. This vector space is isomorphic. It's kind of silly. It's just a commutative ring acting on itself. And you wrote that commutative ring as functions on the discrete set. So you write, um, <coughs> write down this, so this thing is some kind of quantum integrable system. It's, it's integrable because the space is really, this, di this Fourier transform diagonalizes my, my Hamiltonians. Um, and uh, for, a, uh, for a series. Um, and in fact, this, this seems a little silly, but in fact you can find, realize all of the um, integrable particle systems that are known. There, there's a list of not a lot of integrable particle systems. You can realize them basically by this construction. They appear this way out of two-dimensional topological field theories, in fact out of theory X and its variants. So things like Calodro-Moser systems. So this version, this guy is some degenerate version of the trigonometric Calodro-Moser system. Uh, it's not really, it's a very degenerate version. It probably doesn't deserve to be called that, but it's, it's, a, it's a cousin of the collodron moser particle system. And this, again, is going to be how Hitchin systems, how integrable systems are going to appear uh, in higher, higher up. So this construction is kind of a toy version of the appearance of integrable systems in, um, in theory X. Um, well, I'm just, I'm just saying I have a bunch of uh, functions that are commuting. Okay, fine. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I, I mean, we'll s yeah. Can you indicate what makes it the toy version and not the real version? Um, well, we're going to um, construct these things out of four dimensional. So what are we going to try to get to soon, not very soon at this rate, is um, <laughs> constructing. Uh, so the, what I would like to explain is that if I so these games that we're playing with 2D topological field theories, we're going to try to play the exact same game with 4D topological field theories. And so where, where I'm trying to head to is if you abstractly start with a 4D topological field theory or something a little bit weaker in this say that it's 4D only relative to some natural parameters, you can construct out of it some, something that's going to be an integrable system. It's called the Cybergwitten system of that, of that theory. And in the case of these class S theories, these are going to be Hitchin systems. So that's how I'm going to want to explain the picture of how Hitchin systems appear in, in theory X, and they're going to appear by this kind of procedure. So this is, um, and so basically all that are most known algebraic integral systems somehow can be fit into this story. Um, you just have to. Um, yeah, okay, now I guess my time is, is, is that my time? Uh, yeah, um, this is, uh, all right, maybe it's a good, as good a place to stop as any. Yeah. Uh, well, I'll try to explain that. I mean, I, I, I think probably the physicists are very un unhappy with this. Uh, at least Andy always frowns when I say this. So uh, that's probably the wrong. In four dimensions, this is going to be a much closer to what a physicist called modular vacuum. Uh, the idea, and I'll explain this in more detail next time, is that somehow that Z of S1, uh, and this is very close to what appeared in, in Andy's talk, Z of S1 is the, um, are the local operators, local operators in my, in my 2D field theory, in a 2D topological field theory. And uh, given a local operator, you, you uh, want to attach something like a vacuum expectation value to a, to a vacuum. Given a background, your vacuum, you attach a vacuum expectation value. So 2D local operators, Give, give functions, give functions, which are called VEVs, on on spaces of vacuum. Give, you have to fix a vacuum, and then you get you get a number. Now, since I live in this toy world of topological field theory, I'm going to take this as a definition. So, given a topological field theory, I can define a space. So, for the I'll define the moduli space of a topological field theory to be spec of local operators. So the claim is local operators are something that we'll, we'll discuss in more detail. Next time it's, it's going to be what I attach to an n minus 1 sphere. 
And I can just define this to be, now of course you might complain this is a, always an affine scheme by construction. So we'll have more sophisticated, if we have this way we won't, but we should have more sophisticated thing where you don't get necessarily affine things, but by the same kind of construction. From a field theory you can construct some space over which local operators by definition are functions. And that's an approximation, and the claim is it's a good approximation not to the moduli space of the physical theory, I don't know what the physical theory is, but the, of the topological, so it's a piece, so in this case it might be a Coulomb branch or something, sure. some piece of the moduli space of the honest physical theory. So something you talked in here somewhere is the fact that since you're taking, I'd say if there's some commutativity, it's probably by the fact that you take local operators, is that? That's right, that's right. So the ring of local operators is pretty close to commutative. Yeah, and that, so, yeah. The 2D Yang Mills one, or? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, no, I mean. Yes. Yes. I mean, yeah, I, I just. So you describe this two dimensional topological proof theory, and you say that it must be a complexification uh, of the theory X, right? I don't know if it must be, but I, I'm saying it is. Yeah. So or, I mean, I guess I, yeah. Did you explain it uh, in any way? Or no. Um, I, um, I'll, I can just write it, and that makes it more official. Uh, Yang, Mills, Higgs. Um, no, uh, uh, you know, at this point, uh, I don't have much to, uh, to work with uh, about theory X. Uh, what I'm going to try to, I would try to deduce is I need to go, so where I, the plan was to build some toy models of topological field theories. I want to get up to three-dimensional, to give you rosansky witten theory as a toy model for three-dimensional field theories. And then I'll take some kind of axiom that's going to come from Andy's talk, roughly, that, that if I take theory X on something like a surface cross S1, it's going to be a rosansky witten theory. So this is roughly what Andy said. He didn't say the words rosansky witten theory. He said supersymmetric field theory that C, and he called it C. C cross S1 was a supersymmetric theory that attached to the Hitchin space. And from that axiom, once we get that, then anything that's below that you're going to get, we can derive from this. So in particular, S2 cross T2 is S2 cross S1 cross S1. So that's sort of how I'm going to derive this. Um, but I'm, I have to start somehow from the ground up, get some, so I wanted to do the B model and rosensky witt model today also. But, and, then, and then we'll be able to start trying to relate this to two things that are that. Yeah, yeah, there's not, not a lot of wiggle room, except that, you know, I have a lot of dimensions down, and I, you know, when I have S2 cross T2, and that's what, again, games we want to play, we have what we do on the different circles, and, you know, there's going to be various, various games we're going to be able to play. But, but there's no game theory X is rigid. What's not rigid is the, the inputs I'm putting in, the, the geometry. Yeah. If I take two groups like um, B3 and C3, which are Langman's dual, mm -hmm. um, so you told me that they have to do with like theory X for a Liandra and yeah. I get a dagger of morphism of, but in order to get B3, you need to start with the Liandra D4, and to get C3, you need to start with the Liandra uh, A4. So I'm a little bit confused for which Liandra which theory X is going to correspond to these like, two Langlands dual groups? Uh, oh. I, don't, I, I can't answer that right now. Let's, let's table that. Yeah. Um. Well, I never gave a very formal definition, but the, what, I, what I said is suppose I give you a field theory of dimension n plus 1, um, then I can ask. And in fact, I won't really care about that field theory making sense for n plus 1 manifolds. So in, in practice, this is going to be something I get out of factorization homology. It's something I'm going to write down very concretely. Uh, I'm going to have an, and this actually again appeared in Andre's talk yesterday, uh, how we got invariance for surfaces out of filling them in by three manifolds. But if you give, um, if you have a theory of dimension n plus 1, you can talk about having a, a theory of dimension n valued in that. So that means that for any manifold of dimension up to n, 
I'm going to attach not a number, I'm going to attach an element of the theory. Um, so I have two theories, Z and T. So I have uh, T is an n plus 1 dimensional theory, and I'm trying to define Z relative to T. And I'm just going to say that Z of any manifold is an element of T of that same manifold. Um, maybe a, a more formal way to say this is it's a boundary condition. That, that Z defines the boundary conditions in, or if you'd like, that Z of a point, so you, the, the kind of the cleanest way to say that is that Z of a point is an element of T of a point, and everything else is defined by this by integration. Yeah. It was something much simpler. So before we were evaluating our TFT in a two category of complex algebra, so we would lift the two category of algebra over the center. The claim is that it wasn't to the level of four, but if we lift, then maybe we can hold it. That's right. So here, here we're doing something simple, but it's misleadingly simple. Uh, we're going to lift it to just saying that instead of, yeah, so what you're saying, you don't want to, relative to C, you want relative to the center, <laughs> which is so instead of looking at C linear category, you look at center linear categories, except that in higher dimensions, the center won't be actually commutative. It'll be, in this case, it will be E2. And so you'll need factorization of to say what it's relative to. So that's why I want to say it in that language. But yes, in this case, all I'm saying is that you go from C linear categories to Z linear categories, center linear categories, and you have more chance. But in general, you can talk about, uh, given a boundary, what it means to have a boundary condition, which will, have, which will be dualiz and dualizable boundary condition. So it'll mean that this guy is an, is an element in here. Um, well, suppose it, I'm thinking. Suppose this is an example of a uh, uh, maybe this is valued. This is an valued in n categories. So, so it's a so it's a uh, something from the. Um, um, it's going to be a kind of a, a correspondence from the from the unit. I mean, it's a, so, so I don't know. Think of a domain wall or a span from the from the unit to, from the trivial. So I want to think of this as a boundary condition from the trivial theory to my to my theory. That's what a boundary condition is. Um, and then that I can talk about that being n dualizable. So that means that for any manifold up to dimension n, I can ask that this be well defined here. So here, in my case, z, t of m was things that are linear over the center. So instead of you know, getting a number, I would get a function on the center. Instead of getting a vector space, I'd get a sheaf on the center. And then if you wanted to get the absolute theory, you'd have to do some kind of push forward operation, some integration over the center, which may or may not make sense. So that's the caricature. Yeah. Uh, does that mean that the answer for ZS1 has to be the same? Well, you know, I, I uh, yeah. <laughs> this was supposed to go by very quickly, so we wouldn't, wouldn't have a chance to see any of the detail. Uh, I, I had to be careful what category, when I said category of unitary representation, it's really a real form of the category of complex representation. Mm -hmm. the, this thing I attach to the circle is not going to be the same. It's going to be kind of L2 class functions on the compact group, it's sort of a real, f or, or algebraic functions on the compact group, so finite sums of matrix elements on the compact group. So it's not the same as what the complex guy attaches. It's a real form of that. It's a real, it's a real, it's a real vector space rather than complex. It's complexification. It, it's a real form of the algebra. Finally, when I apply this to a surface. Right, so the, the, the point is for when you get to a surface, the question is are you looking at local systems for the compact groups or local systems for the complex, complexification? That the Yang-Mills-Higgs theory is trying to calculate the volume of space of local systems for the complexification. And, and this really sees the difference. Yeah. Yeah, so the difference between real and complex class functions, mm. it's real difference between real and complex bundles when you integrate over surface will be the difference between real and complex local systems, which is a huge one when it's not compact, when it's compact. Okay. Thanks.